the world of ancient evil, ancient ill. In this war of survival, we must keep before our minds not only the evil things we fight against, but the good things we are fighting for. We are fighting today for security, for progress, and for peace. Not only for ourselves, but for all men. Not only for one generation, but for all generations. conversion got underway, pay envelopes were thinner. Bill Turner took a cut of $15. No more overtime. Take home pay was cut. But the rent wasn't. Nor the price of shoes. price of food. Bill thought of the promises made during the war of C.E. Wilson, president of General Electric. After the war is won, take home pay on a 40 hour a week basis must eventually represent the higher levels of pay that now prevail. No, things weren't what Bill had hoped for. Roosevelt was gone, and his enemies were on hand to claim the victory. Pay cuts at home, oppression abroad. Bill didn't like it. The UE is a good-sized outfit. Over 600,000 men and women organized in hundreds of locals. In Bill's local, the cut in take-home pay was on everybody's mind. Other locals felt the same way, and the union asked for an increase of $2 a day. The companies claimed they were unable to pay it unless price ceilings were hoisted. But UE had the facts. Let's take a look at a refrigerator that retailed at $169 in 1939. Here's where the money went. Raw materials and depreciation. Advertising distribution costs and profits, manufacturer's profits. Against all this are the production labor costs, $17.40. Since 1939, the margin of profit had increased. OPA granted an increase of $7.77. The workers were producing more per hour and saving the company an estimated $3.66 per refrigerator. The UE demand of $2 a day would only mean $4.35 more in labor costs. Even with this increase, the Federal Trade Commission estimated that in the first year of full production, profits on refrigerators would be nearly $7 million more than in 1939. Furthermore, the companies were in possession of tremendous wartime profits. No, prices did not have to go up. 
except for the greed of the companies. Another company propaganda angle was that wage increases would cause inflation because the workers, with their war bonds, would have too much money. Here again, UE had the facts. A government survey tells the truth about which families have what savings. Nearly two-thirds have only 7%. All this is held by 10% of the people. In other words, the majority of people have so little that a week or two of unemployment or an illness wipes out the savings. As Bill pointed out, the layoffs during reconversion and the reduction in take-home pay meant big trouble to millions of families. What the companies left unsaid was how they rated the United States Treasury. Republicans and Southern Democrats by wartime tax bills guaranteed profits to all corporations through 1946, even if they were not producing. President Roosevelt called the bill relief for the greedy, not for the needy. In effect, an anti-labor Congress gave a huge strike fund to big business. No wonder UE President Fitzgerald had to report no progress on his wage negotiations. The electrical manufacturers have refused to bargain in good faith. In other basic industries too, such as auto and steel, the employers are tough and unreasonable. As Phil Murray says, there is a conspiracy by big business against American democracy. To understand this conspiracy, we must remember what happened after World War I in 1919. At that time, to meet the high cost of living, labor unions asked for wage increases. The answer was a lesson. Employers mobilized the full power of the government against the unions. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer said he was after communists. Under cover of red baiting, he and the employers crippled the trade unions. In two years, one third of the membership was lost. Big business was in control. It ran the government. It brought us to 1929. To this, and this, and this. They want no get rich quick era of bogus prosperity, which will end for them in selling apples on a street corner. Roosevelt is dead and a reactionary Congress has taken over. Big business thinks it can repeat 1919. We in the CIO want industrial peace. But if big business wants to take America for a ride again, we intend to fight. Bill Turner voted to strike. 
one of the ballots that rolled up a majority of 83% in favor of action. The locals voted to fight for food and clothing and rent against the company's drive for undue profits and fatter dividends. The company's greed can only be realized by knowing all the facts about them. Here's what Bill and the UE were up against. The plant where Bill worked The plant where Bill worked employed 15,000 people. It was only one of the General Electric Network employing 125,000 workers. Westinghouse employed 75,000. General Motors Electrical Division, 25,000. Together they control 50% of the industry and in December 1942 the Department of Justice brought General Electric and Westinghouse into court on charges of monopolizing fluorescent lamps. Also in 1942, a grand jury slapped General Electric with a criminal indictment, charging that General Electric, along with other companies, did unlawfully, willfully, and feloniously conspire, combine, confederate, and agree together to defraud the United States by making collusive fraudulent, identical, and non-competitive bids at unreasonably high prices. But this is not all. In spite of war, these companies operate internationally through subsidiaries, stock participation, and cartel agreements with various other companies. E. Gay Fabron Industry, Algamina Electricitate Gesellschaft, Siemens Schuchert Siemens Halske, Opel, Fried Krupp Antikaselshop, Tokyo Shibaura, Mitsubishi Electrical Engineering Company, Westinghouse Electric Company of Japan, Compagnia Generale di Elettricità, Magrini Società Anonima, and many more all over the world. Internationally, as well as nationally, profit, big profit, is the battle cry. A General Electric Group agreement sent the price of tungsten carbide from $50 a pound to $453 a pound. This monopoly price kept production low. The United States government cracked down with a criminal indictment. the damage had been done. Tungsten carbide was one of the great bottlenecks in war production. On the other side of the world, Kwanzo Tanaka, chairman of Mitsubishi, announced that part of their profits had been set aside for Westinghouse. Where did this money come from? This is but a part of what Bill and the UE had to face. These companies have powerful connections in other industries which were also fighting the labor movement. The nature and power of these connections staggers the imagination. Take General Electric, for example. Its total assets are $543 million, over half a billion. That's a lot of money. Yes, General Electric is a big company. Yet here it is in scale as one of 13 industrial companies, including U.S. Steel, which are controlled by the J.P. Morgan interests. Plus 12 utility companies, including American Telephone and Telegraph. Plus eight railroads. Plus three major banks. Morgan interests control a total of $31 billion through these companies alone. $31 billion. It's so much money, it's impossible to think of it. Suppose it was laid out in $100 bills.
the end of a block of, say, 400 feet, you could pick up $78,000 in about 15 minutes. But to pick up the rest of the $31 billion, you'd have to walk clear around the Earth one and a quarter times, and it would take you 400 years on a 40-hour week. Yes, the Morgan Group is powerful. It took the power of the United States government, even, to find out these facts. And since our taxes paid for this investigation, let's get our money's worth. Morgan is the largest group. Then there is the strong Kuhn Loeb group. The Mellon interests, which have Westinghouse. DuPont with General Motors. And then there is Rockefeller. And three other groups, making up a grand total of some $82 billion assets in 1945, exclusive of government-owned plants which they are now busy buying up cheap. These assets represent control over plants, railways, banks, and most important of all, jobs. Eight groups dispose of over 30% of all the assets in the United States. These eight groups operate through a screen of 106 corporations and some idea of their power can be had by seeing in scale how many firms own the rest. These 250,000 corporations exclude the million odd small businesses in America. Eight groups control the American economy not only because of their concentration of wealth but through their strategic ownership of basic industries. Every consumer and every businessman in America hands over a percentage of their earnings to these eight groups, often without knowing it. This is what is meant by big business. This is what is meant by their control of American economy. Big business is international. There were similar groups in Germany, Japan, Italy, England, France, Holland, Belgium, Spain, and smaller countries. Through colonial rule or subservient governments, they control raw materials and markets in most of the world. This is the big league in world business. Its name is imperialism. It leads to war, as Hitler's story shows. For Hitler had a dream, that his big business should dominate the world. He called his dream the new order. Foreign big business was weakened during the war and today, American big business is the strongest. And they have a dream, to dominate the world. They call their dream the American century. The American century means the century of big business instead of the century of the common people. <laughs> 